I was a Christian Zionist throughout my youth. Um, as I entered into young adulthood, I was me, Jonathan William O'Toole. I was a Christian Zionist. That may surprise some of you if you have known me in the past um, 10 or 15 years. Nonetheless, it's true. I was a Christian Zionist. And um, Puck, the uh, one of the characters in A Midsummer Night's Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, um, says at one point that the heresies that men do leave are hated most by them they did deceive. Let me say that again. The heresies that men do leave are hated most by them they did deceive. And that category would uh, fit me very well. I was um, inherited this deception as, uh, in some ways, um, the, a, a child or a grandchild of the Jesus movement. I was too young to uh, really be involved in the 1970s Jesus movement. Since I was only born in 1979, uh, toward the end of 1979, uh, nonetheless, I inherited that culture from my parents, and I thank God for my parents. They uh, homeschooled us for the most part and kept us de-emphasized TV, taught uh, my brothers and sisters and I, of whom I am the oldest, to be critical of the culture around us. We were raised countercultural, but uh, part of the problems, one of the problems of the 70s movement and of the um, Southern Baptist culture I was raised in, also sometimes charismatic, evangelical, sometimes assemblies of God, but basically evangelical Protestant culture that I was raised in, with all the good things it gave me, one of the um, uh, infections of that culture is Christian Zionism. And I want to talk about that now. That's why I've entitled this video, Confessions of a Christian Zionist. That's not a joke. I was a Christian Zionist. I grew up influenced not so much by John Hagee. He was kind of coming uh, to um, the leadership of Christian Zionism as I was beginning to be disillusioned. I mean, literally, that's the best word. The illusion that was over me was, was beginning to disintegrate. So that's why I like that word, disillusioned. But as I was beginning to be disillusioned with the illusion of Christian Zionism, um, let me begin by telling a story. I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in the fall of the year 2000, just as we were approaching the presidential election. Um, and I helped a farmer called Steve Fry to cut um, a maze. It was before we were quite to the point of using, I mean, some people had GPS, but we were still manually bringing surveyors out to cut a, a harvest time maze that people could go, like literally walk through a maze that if you flew over it or looked from a height would uh, show a pattern. And the pattern was, in this case, a, a very intricate uh, design that, that Steve had designed of the presidential seal. And my job was to take the four corners of the square that the surveyors had had marked and the center point of the square, uh, rope it off with, with twine and stakes, and cut, uh, along with the help of my brother, Stephen, uh, the presidential seal and the words, Vote 2000, into the... Uh, uh, into the Milo. It wasn't maize because Milo is about chest high, so you, it's easier to bring your children and not have to fear about losing your little children because you can look up over the Milo and find them. So, and the Milo also has a beautiful um, rusty red color when it comes to fruition. But I digress. I cut that uh, like well, more than 75% of that maize, but it was coming just a, a few days before it was time for the maize to open. And Steve, the owner of the property, whose project it was, who had hired me, was starting to get a little bit nervous. And Steve uh, went out there. I, I told him, look, I'm going to finish it. And I was. I was going to finish it. It was going to be closed, but I was going to finish it. And I was very painta painstakingly cutting this pattern into the Milo. Steve went out there. And uh, because he, he kind of jumped the gun, he got a little nervous. He thought I wasn't going to make the deadline. And he took a mower and he quickly finished the last quadrant and a little bit sloppily, the last quadrant of this um, 
presidential seal of the eagle holding the the um, the branch of um, olive branch of peace in one talon, and the um, and it was over five acres, so it was a considerably large maze. Uh, it required some artistic talent and some patience, and that's why I was doing it so slowly and gradually, and I was going to make it. Well, he finished the last part. It so happened that it wasn't the talent. I had already finished the whole feathers, the bird, the e pluribus unum, and the message vote 2000. All that was left was the quadrant that had the talent, uh, not the one holding the arrows of war, but the one holding the olive branch of peace. And tragically, although it still, you know, was a beautiful maze. I don't have a, I wish I had a photo to show you now. This is, you know, 18 years ago now, but uh, more than 18 years ago. But um, tragically, this, this image, and portentously, I think, this image actually came out. It said it was encouraging people to vote in November and to come pay your tickets, wander through the maze, try to find the center point of it. And there was a band and candy and, and snacks and you come visit the farm. Well, the maze was perfect except the part that Steve had finished. And he actually apologized to me later. He's like, wow, you did good, Jonathan. Uh, I, I, was, I got hasty and I got impatient. And what the image looked like, imagine the presidential seal, the um, eagle is holding the, talon, the, the arrows of war in the one talon, and in the other talon, supposed to be an olive branch of peace. But that was where he had gone too fast uh, in his impatience. And the olive branch of peace, the, the talon was visible, but it was shriveled, and the olive branch of peace was shriveled, and it had no leaves. I wish I could show you. I'm not embellishing this at all. Um, I don't have any photos of it remaining, but that's how it was. Um, that, you know, the Bush administration came in. The Clintons were evil, obviously. He was a warmonger. He bombed Serbia. But the real wars, as we all know now, with September 11th, uh, the real, the real wave, tidal wave of of criminal warfare swept over us um, in the year, the next year, the year two thousand and one, and in the ensuing years up to today, you know, December almost twenty nineteen, December twenty eighteen. Now we're still involved in more and more and more wars, and in those wars that came out from the fruit of that next year. So it was very portentous to me that the. Um, Olive Branch of Peace had at the last moment by a, by a movement of the owner of this uh, five-acre field had, had been turned into a shriveled, dead twig in the shriveled arm of peace of the eagle that represented the United States of America. And uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because, to a large degree, the wars that we're involved in are on behalf of Israel and the Zionist. And at that time, I was a Christian Zionist. I enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps um, uh, with a delayed enlistment. I finally went in in, um, I believe it was December. No, no, it would have been all the way into the, yeah, maybe in December, right? Um, and then uh, started my uh, basic training, which lasted for three months. I completed it, and then they kicked me out because I was involved in Soldiers in the Army of God, HBO's Soldiers in the Army of God, which was released toward the end of um, March or the first week of April, uh, right at in the week that I, after I had become a Marine, I was no longer a recruit, it was released, and it cut from scenes, I didn't bomb anybody or kill anybody, but it cut from scenes of Timothy, not Timothy McVeigh, excuse me, Eric Rudolph, and other uh, people who had um, had shot abortion doctors, and then to, to me making, you know, radical statements, but not threatening anyone. Uh, but it it associated me with with the actions of uh, Eric Rudolph, and so it was enough to make um, the uh, 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 a general of the Marine Corps, who was only two steps down from the Secretary of the Navy, to make the decision to to separate me from the Marine Corps. And one of the reasons I had joined the Marine Corps was actually because. Uh, it was a there was a mix of of reasons in my mind as a young man, but one of the reasons was. One of the factors was my Zionism, my so-called Christian Zionism. I actually think that um, Zionism, if you if you remain in it and don't repent of it, is ultimately a repudiation of Christianity. But I'm getting ahead of myself. 
I'm getting ahead of myself. One of the factors in joining the Marine Corps at that time, as I was frustrated with the um, fact that there was no organization that I could join that would lead me to be able to fight as a soldier uh, in, an or- in any kind of organized context against legalized abortion. So I defaulted back to my uh, Zionist um, influences that had been allowed to influence me in my uh, upbringing. People like you know Seven Hundred Club, Pat Robertson, and other speakers that would come to church that would that would conflate the state of Israel with the uh, the Israel of the Bible or the Israel of God, the spiritual Israel of God, without making clear uh, historical or theological or, or exegetical distinctions between you know who is the real Israel and the political entity of the state of Israel. Um, and the person, you know, there's, there's, it's a big, long topic, more than the I can cover in this video. But anyway, that that muddle of of biblical uh, fundamentalism, evangelicalism, uh, with a flavor of Christian Zionism, positioned me where I thought, okay, if I can't fight abortion because there's no structure in the United States, maybe I can. If I join the Marines, um, there'll be a war in the Middle East, and I can fight on behalf of Israel, and I'll be on God's side by fighting on behalf of Israel to fight her enemies like Saddam Hussein or somebody like that. And I, I, I had, I, I guess intuitively and through listening to, you know, my dad was listening, who was a pastor, was listening to Hal Lindsey a lot. And um, Hal Lindsey is a radical Christian Zionist. I think he's very, very old or uh, I don't know if he's passed away. I think he's still alive, but he's very old now in his, in his late 80s probably. Excuse me. But... Uh, he was one of the um, inf- Christian Zionist influences, but the author of the late, the late great planet Earth, uh, famous for his uh, false predictions. So I kind of thought that by joining the U.S. Marine Corps, I might be positioning myself to to fight for Israel. So if I couldn't fight to defend the preborn, maybe I could be on God's side by fighting those um, you know Arabs or the Muslim enemies of Israel or the Palestinians or something like that. That was how. Um, twisted my mind was at that time. Well, I got booted out of the Marine Corps for being involved in that uh, HBO documentary, which uh, I collaborated with being booted out. I signed their thing. It was an honorably classed discharge, so it didn't ever hold me back in um, in my future. That wasn't like a dishonorable discharge. I had done nothing wrong. I passed boot camp with flying colors, but nonetheless, they released that video at the film festivals and the nationwide release, and the Marine Corps wanted me out. And it was a good thing. It was really a blessing in disguise, although it did not feel that way at the time. Um, Ultimately, it was a blessing in disguise because we got involved in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, through lies, uh, deception of the Bush administration and the people behind the scenes of the Bush administration. Um, and the deception of September 11th, which is only now, you know, beginning. Many people have seen through it for many years, but only now beginning. Just this week, the um, New York um, Attorney General's uh, office, I heard, um, actually heard, uh, received and responded to um, the request to convene a grand jury to look into it. So you may be on the cusp of real... um, uh, exposure of the September 11th lie. But nonetheless, I was uh, removed from the military industrial complex, at least at the direct level, still tied in as an American citizen. But in, in April of 2001, just a few months before the great uh, false flag of September 11th, and ultimately I would have, my um, the brigade would have been activated. I would have done prob- probably multiple tours of duty in Iraq and or Afghanistan. And so I thank God. But at the time, I felt very dejected, very rejected. And I don't normally impute uh, words to God or say, thus saith the Lord or the Lord spoke to me. But in this uh, instance in my life, I did get um, a spiritual message from God. I was walking through the battalion command, experiencing this rejection. I was being placed in a, a squad with... Um, you know, at that time they were still separating homosexuals, uh, thieves, liars, and I was placed in the in the liar squad. You know, I'd march them to breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day as they were separating me from the unit uh, from the U.S. military, and 
so I, moral offenders, even though I hadn't done anything uh, evil, I hadn't lied to anyone, I hadn't, you know, committed any, it was just that before I ever enlisted, I had participated in this documentary. And I hadn't made any criminal statements in the documentary. It was it was very much free speech. I wasn't in uniform. I wasn't even a recruit yet. Nonetheless, uh, I, as I was feeling dejected and marching to, th through the battalion command uh, one afternoon, and as the whole world you know of military enlistment that I had plunged myself into was falling apart around me, um, I felt an assurance in my spirit. And I'm, I'm a word from God. I don't say this in the sense of overruling, overruling the Bible. I believe the Bible is the word of God. So, but I, uh, a reassurance in my spirit from God that I was not the one being rejected. The way that Samuel was rejected uh, when they the people wanted Saul, they wanted a king. Uh, not that I was supposed to be the king, but that the rejection, in the same sense, the rejection that I was experiencing, God showed my spirit that it wasn't really about me, that they were not rejecting me, they were rejecting him. They'd already rejected him. And that comforted my spirit. And the past, you know, most of two decades, as things have played out, uh, especially since September 11th, have demonstrated that that is the case, that God has, uh, to a large degree, turned this country and her military over to a reprobate mind. And I was blessed to be separated uh, from the military in a way that I could not even be drafted. Now I'm too old. <laughs> but that was a blessing. That was a blessing, and my life has been more fruitful since. But nonetheless, the the um, the um, strands of Christian Zionism had were, were to some degree in, still entangled in my consciousness and in my mind and in my brain. I was I had received that conditioning, that uh, brainwashing, that that uh, psychological. Um, preconditioning of Christian Zionism. And fundamentally, just to blow this wide open, Christianity is, is, has a position about Zion. And so it's a fundamental double-mindedness because Zion is the hill on which David uh, founded his kingdom in Jerusalem. It represents the power of God and the kingdom of God and the line of David, and all three of those, the power of God, the kingdom of God, the line of David, the throne of David, are fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his kingdom, and in no other, okay? No socialist state of Israel, all right, can fulfill Zion. The true Zion of God is not what uh, uh, Minicum Begin says it is, okay, or what Ehud Barak says it is, or what Benjamin Netanyahu says it is, all Christ-haters but is what is the Lord Jesus. Ultimately, the Lord Jesus Christ himself is Zion, the fulfillment of Zion. So, at the very beginning, any, any Zionism, just like any Antichrist, is a, counter, a satanic counterfeit. But I hadn't worked this all through yet. And so, as I got kicked out of the Marine Corps, I'd never been in California before. I was there on the streets of San Diego outside of MCRD, the recruit training depot, in my civilian clothes, and I bought myself a bus ticket, and I went up to Hollywood to see what L.A. looked like. I'd never been there before. And I got there to L.A., and I checked into a hostel. I think it was run by some liberal Presbyterian group, if I'm not mistaken. Excuse me. And the, uh, the hostel, it so happened that I checked into, gave me an advertisement for um, Passover was was coming up, and they gave me an advertisement for a seminar they were going to hold in a couple of days, that where they were going to bring a Jewish man in to explain to us the meaning of Passover. And I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. Let me turn my chair around here. I thought this is pretty cool. I'm trying to get comfortable. Um. And I, I decided I would attend this um, seminar, and so I made sure I, I made a note of it, and when it came around in a couple of days, I was one of the first ones there. Excuse me. And so, uh, this Jewish guy came in, and he was kind of heavy set, looked like a reformed Jewish guy, 
So I'll, you know, given I wasn't hearing this from an Orthodox uh, rabbi, I know they would have a different take, but it was very eye-opening for me because we sat down in the seminar room. It was a little library. It was a beautiful hostel on Sunset Boulevard, or if, as I recall, or very near Sunset Boulevard, and uh, had a beautiful library. And we sat down, maybe a dozen people in there, and this um, Jewish uh, businessman with a little skull cap, but it was a big, big man. Um, started to talk about Passover. Uh, and what he said was that Passover was about crystal night. I'm not joking. I'm not in, embellishing, embellishing or exaggerating. He said that Passover was about crystal night, the night when the Nazis came and broke all the windows and terrorized all the Jews. And I thought in Germany, and I thought, okay, that's an interesting uh, modern rereading of Passover, but eventually he's going to get around to telling the real story of Passover. So I kept waiting, and I, and, I, and I was starting to get impatient. And, you know, I mean, 45 minutes into this thing, he hadn't breathed the word Moses. He hadn't breathed the word lamb. He hadn't said anything about the Bible. <laughs> I mean, it was literally like we were just, he was just telling us that Passover was about crystal night, and that's all there is to it. And then it was over. And he, had, he said, question and answer session. And I think I was one of the first ones to raise my hand, but I asked him a question. And I smiled and I said, now, um, you've said that Passover is about crystal night, and I get that that's a, a modern interpretation of it, but doesn't it also have something to do with, um, this was my question, I said, doesn't it also have something to do with um, Moses, the parting of the Red Sea, the Lamb's blood on the doorpost, the spirit of death passing through the Egyptians and killing the firstborn. Isn't, isn't there, um, isn't that part of the story too? <laughs> and he, he looked at me and he shrugged his shoulders and he raised his eyebrows. He rolled his eyes and he said, yes, it also has mythological overtones. Let me say that again. He said, yes, it also has mythological overtones. Now, I'm aware, <laughs> I'm aware that, you know, a Hasid or an Orthodox rabbi would give me a much more biblical answer to that. I get it. I get it. I get it. But it was the first stage in, you know, I think I knew at some level that they were, I knew that they were, you know, liberal, um, you know, and reformed and, and, and other, um, you know, you know, Jews that, that were the, the equivalent of what the United uh, Unitarianism is to Christianity, right? Um, so I know, I know that this isn't quite fair to represent, to let this person represent uh, Judaism or Passover, but it was nonetheless a watershed moment in my mind when I realized, oh, you know, a lot of Jews are really, 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 you know, not God's people at all. <laughs> you know, I mean, unless they repent at some point, which obviously most of them don't, that these are, these are people that could, are probably as far from God as you possibly could get. Certainly this man was uh, in the running for that, in the, in the, in the attitude that he brought toward, I mean, just, just the absolute disdain he had for the fact that I had mentioned the idea that Passover might have something to do with the Bible. He looked at me like, oh, like you're going to bring up that, that old, you know, story like that, like I was just a, a complete um, Philistine, you know, for acting like that, that was even part of the story. And over the next few years, um, especially within about five years, as I got involved with um, graphic signing, holding the graphic signs of aborted babies at schools and educational institutions and abortion clinics and had a lot of interactions with Jews in California and around the country, objecting to, and the Jews would usually uh, come up and object to our Holocaust analogies that the pro-lifers normally make, um, you know, making the, the slaughter of the babies by abortion analogous to their Holocaust or their so-called Holocaust. Um, and they would object to that. And when I realized the basis of their objection to that was that they really didn't look at the preborn as human beings at all. And then I realized that Israel is one of the most pro-abortion states in the world. Um, 
and that Jews, by their own admission, are one of the most pro-abortion ethnicities in the world, and that if you count the uh, preborn babies killed by abortion in the state of Israel alone, the Jews have killed, uh, even if you believe their six million figure of the Holocaust, the Jews have killed more people than any other entity, more Jewish people, more Jewish people than any other entity since World War II, hands down, through their socialized medicine program, which pays for the abortions in Israel. Don't believe me. Look up their official Israeli statistics. They're widely available online. You can look at them. The Israeli government. Suddenly I realized that this, I've been hoodwinked. I've been hoodwinked. And I'm telling you, Christian, who loves the Lord Jesus Christ, if you love Jesus Christ, whether you're a Catholic or an evangelical, a Protestant, uh, if you've been believed that people who push that uh, the Israel Israeli state is the Israel of God or the Israel of the Bible, you've been hoodwinked. Be not deceived. Be disillusioned. And be set free. This is part one. I'll be talking about this more in my next video, but I think this is enough for now. Uh, have a good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are, and may God help you to be disillusioned from the Antichrist, which is Zionism, especially so-called Judeo-Christianity. doesn't exist. It's not real. Moses, Abraham, they're Christians, not Judeo-Christians. They're Christians like you and me. Judaism is a heresy. You say Islam is a heresy? Okay. Judaism is equally a heresy. There are three religions in this world laying claim to the promise of Abraham. They don't all three have it. They're mutually exclusive. Only one of them has it. Uh, you could say none of them have it. That could be logical too. But uh, they can't all three have it. So think about it.